Hello everyone and welcome to Internet Law Review. For today's story, you get to watch me go slowly insane as I discuss the United States Supreme Court Chevron v. National Resource Defense Council, better known as Chevron v. NRDC. This is a 1984 unanimous decision from the United States Supreme Court. In this case, it was a 6-0 decision of the U.S. Supreme Court because three justices had to sit out due to financial conflicts of interest. But it is a decision which I disagree with strongly. The reason I'm bringing this case is up is that it's one of two cases that is a foundational case for a decision that just came down for the Sixth Circuit. And before I discuss that case, I want to discuss the foundational cases so you can see where that came from so it'll make more sense. So let's cover this case and discuss why the Supreme Court got it horribly, horribly wrong. Okay. They say, in the Clean Air Act Amendments of 1977, Congress enacted certain requirements applicable to states that had not achieved a national air quality standard established by the EPA pursuant to earlier legislation. The EPA had a permitting program, and the EPA regulation promulgated to implement this pro permit regulated uh, or requirement allowed the states to adopt a plant-wide definition of the term stationary source. So what we're trying to decide is what a stationary source is. So you can obviously qualify a source of pollution as either moving, transitory, or stationary. So um, a, a stationary source would be a plant of some kind, like a coal plant. But the question is exactly what is a stationary source? And so the question presented by this case, or these cases, is whether the EPA's decision to allow states to treat all the pollution-emitting devices within the same industrial grouping, as though they are encased within the same bubble, is based on a reasonable construction of the statutory term stationary source. So the idea is, can we incorporate multiple things that might otherwise appear to be independent things within the same, same bubble and treat that as a single stationary source. So you can see an advantage to that from a corporate point of view. You know, if you have one really dirty polluting source and it can't be mo mo folded into other sources, then you would have to clean up that source. On the other hand, if you have one really dirty source, but you can fold it into a whole bunch of clean sources so as to bring down the overall average, then you wouldn't have to clean up the dirty source because the overall average is within the limits. So the question is, was the EPA correct to say that the stationary source is this plant-wide model. All right, so there was initially an appeal in the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, so the U.S. Supreme Court is going to cover their case, uh, the case below, a little bit. And the, the says that the, dis, the Court of Appeals observed that the relevant part of the amended Clear Act, Clean Air Act does not explicitly define what Congress envisioned as a stationary source to which the permit program should apply, and further stated the precise issue is not squarely addressed in legislative history. Okay, fair enough. I mean, Congress is not always explicitly in, explicit in defining its terms. Sometimes it defines terms and sometimes not, and sometimes there's a term that probably they should have defined, but they didn't, and that's not that unusual. So we have to figure out what this term meant, even though there's no definition and there's nothing in the history to suggest Congress had one thing or another in mind. Okay, then the, then, uh, the uh, district uh, or the Court of Appeals, based on its precedents concerning the applicability of the bubble concept to certain clean air programs, the Court of Appeals stated that the bubble concept was mandatory in programs designed to merely maintain existing air quality, but held it was inappropriate in programs enacted to improve air quality. So the Court of Appeals, in prior case law, had said that there's two universes. Are we trying to uh, keep a, a plant or a, a, a system in check, or are we trying to correct something that's already broken? And you can imagine why you might want to treat one differently than the other from a policy point of view. So Congress might have very well intended that in one situation it was okay to fold multiple things into an average, but in the other situation you had to look at things in a more discreet fashion. So it's perfectly logical that th that kind of split might be in the law. Okay, since the purpose of the permit program, its reason for being, in the court's view, was to improve air quality, the court held under its bubble concept that, that was inapplicable under the prior precedents. Certainly rational if the Court of Appeals had previously said in other cases that when you're trying to improve air quality in other contexts that the bubble was not good, then it makes sense that it would likewise not be good here. So that, that makes sense. Then the U.S. Supreme Court says we grant certiorari to review the judgment, and we now reverse, so they're going to undo all that. Great. The basic legal error of the Court of Appeals was to adopt a static judicial definition of the term stationary source when it decided that Congress itself had not commanded that definition.
okay, I cannot even begin to describe how much I disagree with that statement. Um, when Congress passes laws, they pass laws, and they're like a thing that has happened, and it is now done. So whatever the term meant when Congress passed it, it is fixed until Congress changes it. That's kind of like what laws are when Congress passes them. It's like Congress spends a lot of time going over the wording and debating different wording and amendments and committees and all kinds of stuff. And so eventually they come out with a statute and the president signs it. Whatever it means at that point, it's fixed. It, Congress has passed it. The president has signed it. It's done. So if the term is not particularly well defined in the statute, then we have to figure out what it means. But whatever it means, it does and always has meant that. It has a fixed meaning unto itself. It can't mean anything else. Congress had a meaning in mind when it passed the statute. It's done. So the basic legal error was to adopt a stack judicial definition? N no, that's kind of exactly what courts are supposed to do. The statute is a thing that has occurred. Courts interpret law. They don't write laws and they don't enforce laws. They interpret the law. The law is fixed. They should interpret it in a fixed way. <sighs> Carrying on, when a court reviews an administrative agency's construction of a statute, it is confronted with two questions. First, always is the question of whether Congress has directly spoken on the precise question. If Congress has been clear, then that's the end of the matter. For the court, as well as the agency, must give effect to unambiguously expressed in town of Congress. That's true. If Congress is clear, Congress is clear. That's fine. If, however, the court determines Congress has not directly addressed the precise question of the issue, the court does not simply impose its own construction on the statute, as would be necessary in the absence of a ministry of interpretation. Uh, no, I strongly disagree with that. That's exactly what a court should do, in my humble opinion. The, the court should impose a construction on the statute. Um, if Congress was unclear about its meaning, then courts have to interpret the law. And courts, when they're interpreting the law, can look to all kinds of things. They can look to how the words were used in other contexts. They can look to other statutes. They can look to other provisions of law. They can look to legislative history. They can, you know, there's all kinds of things that the courts can look at to, in order to try to figure out what Congress meant by something. You know, it's not just a pure shot in the dark. But whatever court, whatever Congress meant, it meant, and it's done now. So the court should, in fact, impose its own construction on the statute. It's like, well, Congress didn't tell us what they meant. So we're now going to, as the, the judicial branch, as the branch in charge with interpreting law, we are now going to interpret the law and tell you what they meant. And if Congress doesn't like it, they can amend the law. But until that happens, we're going to get involved. But no, apparently we're supposed to look to an administrative interpretation for some level because they are interpreting the laws. Last time I checked, they execute laws, but okay. Supreme Court continues. If the statute is silent or ambiguous with respect to the specific issue, the, the question for the court is where the agency's answer is based on a permissible construction of the statute. N no, that is not the question. Um, a, a statute, especially to a well-trained lawyer, can be interpreted in many, many, many different ways. So there's many different reasonable ways of potentially interpreting a statute. Uh, if you're merely looking to what a reasonable interpretation is, well, the, the field is pretty wide. Um, I would, as a judge, certainly look to their interpretation, but I wouldn't give it any sort of controlling authority. You know, they're, they're experts in the field. Their, interpre their interpretation is certainly relevant. It is something worth of considering. Um, you know, the administrative agency, when they're, when they're executing the law, is going to have to take an initial shot in the dark. I mean, if Congress wasn't clear, they're going to have to try to guess what it means. So we can't blame them for taking a guess when Congress wasn't clear. I mean, they have to do something. So they, they're going to take a position because they have no alternative. But that doesn't mean that their position was right, even if it was reasonable. That doesn't make any sense to me. If Congress has explicitly, explicitly left a gap for the agency to fill, there is an express delegation of authority to the agency to ludicate a specific provision of the statute. Sure, I agree with that. If Congress specifically delegates an a area to, to the Congress, or apologize, to the administrative agency, then Congress said, you know, this is a general policy we have, but we don't really, you know, we don't really know what the best way of going about this is. So, you know, you, you go figure it out, administrative agency. You know, we, we you know, don't want to fix this in law for all time. And we'll give, you some, we'll give you some guidelines and you go work out the details. Perfectly fine. You know, that's, that's perfectly reasonable and 
you know, Congress does that all the time because Congress doesn't necessarily want to spell out every detail. They, you know, they say, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give the general parameters and let the agencies figure out some of the, the smaller details. That's perfectly reasonable. Sometimes the legislative delegation is implicit rather than explicit. Sure, that's a possibility. Congress doesn't necessarily have to explicitly say we are delegating this. They can, it can be implied from the, the, the framework of the statute. Okay, I buy that. In such a case, a court may not substitute its own construction of the statutory provision for a reasonable interpretation made by the administrator. Yes, but in such a case, meaning where it is delegated implicitly rather than explicitly. So yes, if it was delegated to the agency, the court should not, in fact may not, substitute its own construction for the interpretation of the agency in that hypothetical. Because if Congress has in fact delegated it to the agency, even if they didn't say so, that's possible. But if they delegate it to the agency, Congress has contemplated the agency is supposed to fill in the gaps. And if that's implicit, that's fine. And if, if they came up with anything even vaguely reasonable, then a court shouldn't substitute its own construction in that hypothetical. But that's assuming the question. It's assuming that they've implicitly given it to the administrative agency. And your own hypothetical that you framed this with was that Congress has been vague about it. So this doesn't make sense. Considerable weight should be afforded to the executive department's construction of a statutory scheme that's entrusted to the administrator. I agree. But the question is, was it entrusted to the administrator? And the premise here is that it wasn't. So this doesn't make any sense. Now the U.S. Supreme Court is going to cite its own precedent. The Supreme Court citing itself. It said, if this choice represents a reasonable accommodation of conflicting policies that were committed to the agency's care by statute, we should not disturb it unless it appears from the statute or legislative history the accommodation is not one Congress would have sanctioned. Yes, I agree with you. If it was committed to the agency's care by statute, if Congress explicitly delegated it to the agency, then sure, you shouldn't disturb the, the agency's interpretation because that's what Congress wanted, and Congress gets to write the law. So if Congress wanted the agency to go figure it out, and they go figure it out, and they did something reasonable, that's correct. I agree with you. No problem. And then they have this nice little trick. It's in light of these well-settled principles, it's clear the Court of Appeals misconstrued the nature of its role in reviewing the regulations at issue. No, no, that doesn't make any sense. You know, it's, it says whether the administrative view is appropriate in the context of program is a reasonable one. No, that's not the question. That is not the question. The question is whether or not the administrator was tasked with it. Were they given the authority? You know, you can delegate authority to someone. That's perfectly fine. And if they were delegated authority and they said, this is what we're going to do, great, no problem. But the question is not whether or not the administrator thinks it's reasonable that they've been given the authority. Because that's basically what the Supreme Court's now saying. It's like, oh, the administrator thinks that they've been delegated authority, so that makes it reasonable. No, 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 no. Would, would an administrator have any reason to, to say that they've been delegated authority? I mean, can you think of a reason? I can think of many, many reasons. So... You know, administrators saying that, oh, yeah, we've been given the authority and this is reasonable interpretation. No, I don't think so. Anyways, a unanimous decision from the U.S. Supreme Court, one that I and many other lawyers deeply, deeply disagree with. Um, so this is one of two foundational cases. We're going to discuss the second foundational case, um, hopefully tomorrow, which drives me even more insane. If that's if that's a possibility, I think it is. And then we'll discuss the Sixth Circuit case that applies these decisions and show you how it can all go wrong. But until later, my friends.